that. <laughs> I was on mute. Okay, cool. Right. Yeah, I'll go ahead and get my screen ready to yeah, share. Sure. And uh, we'll go ahead and start. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah, I can see. How about this? Yes. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, um, yeah, so my name is Nader Dabit, like you mentioned, and I am a developer advocate. I've been with AWS for about a little over two years. And I'm going to be talking about, um, this is the first time I've given this talk, actually, but it's a, it's a subject that's pretty interesting to me. And I saw that the other speaker is talking about CDK, which is a great uh, you know, um, topic for what I'm talking about, because they're both kind of along the same lines. And uh, my talk is called Transforming GraphQL, Full Stack Infrastructure as Code. Um, a lot of the content, a lot of the things that I specialize in are along the lines of full stack development because I'm really traditionally a front end developer. And I think it's interesting um, that the team that I work on, it kind of uh, brought me in because the team that I'm on is really interested and in, we're building tooling and services that are kind of targeted at not only back end developers, but also front end developers. So a lot of the um, you know, work that we do is kind of like helping new developers come into the AWS ecosystem through our front end tooling. And I'm going to talk a lot about that. So to get started, I'm going to kind of go over what the uh, talk is going to be, you know, um, kind of structured by. So first of all, I'm going to give an intro uh, to myself and also to my team and some of the stuff that we're working on and also to uh, the, the technologies I'm going to be talking about. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, data modeling using the uh, GraphQL transform library, which I'm also going to be talking about. And then we're going to look, uh, jump into some live coding and do uh, rapidly prototype a, a, an API. Um, and then we're going to then look at some live examples that I've built using some of these technologies. So yeah, my name is Nader Dabit, and I've been um, a software engineer now for about 10 years. And I've also written a couple of books. Um, I'll talk about one of those books in just a moment. And I've done quite a bit of open source. Um, I was doing a lot of front end open source. And now I'm doing a lot of stuff along the lines of full stack cloud and full stack serverless, kind of combining infrastructure as code along with front end client uh, you know, apps. So you can kind of take these packaged apps and kind of deploy and have something to start off with along uh, the lines of a, com a lot of common uh, use cases. For instance, uh, the first really popular one that I open sourced in this paradigm, I guess is called conference app in a box, and it's essentially uh, back-end infrastructure as code um, and a front-end mobile app that you can deploy to both Android and React Native for conferences. And it has all of this stuff built in. So when you deploy, you get authentication. Uh, you also get an API. You get authorization rules. Um, you get you know, all of the, everything you would need really um, to kind of have a conference app, even chat, real-time chat, all that stuff's built in. And it's been pretty popular. Um, uh, I've talked to over 100 conferences now that have been interested in using it. It's open source, so it's free. I don't know exactly how many people have used it, but I know at least 30 that I've worked with have actually launched it and used it in their event. And now that there's not as many events happening because of the coronavirus, I'm not sure exactly you know, what's going on with it, but it's still, um, it's still pretty popular. And I'm actually building a web version of that that um, hopefully will be released uh, soon. And I'm a developer advocate. and Developer advocate, I think, is different for uh, each team. So like one company might have a, a DA and, and they do like a certain subset of things and they have certain goals, but it's, it's, it's much different, I think, than your typical engineering role or even um, any role because it's so different across different orgs. Um, so within AWS, you typically have two main types of developer advocates. You have the ones that are on the main evangelism team and they uh, work close, I wouldn't say they work more closely with, uh, with marketing, but they're more aligned with um, the marketing teams, I guess you could say. And then, then you have the developer advocates that work within each individual category or each individual you know, um, service. So you might see that you also see serverless DAs that work on the serverless team. And then I'm a DA on the Amplify team. Actually the mobile team, but we're really focused on uh, on uh, now kind of categorizing all of this stuff as Amplify, even though we still are doing mobile. The book that I've uh, currently working on is called Full Stack Serverless, and it's actually talking a lot about the stuff that I'm, I'm gonna be talking about here today. 
and it's already available in uh, Manning Early Access Program, and it'll be available in paperback um, in a couple of months. And it's talking a lot uh, about the stuff, it's talking about a lot of the stuff I'm gonna be talking about here today. So the team that I work on, I mentioned it's uh, the AWS mobile team. Um, and within AWS mobile, we have a couple of things. We have AWS Amplify, we have Device Farm, we have AWS AppSync, we also have the AWS mobile SDKs. And um, we're kind of transitioning, we still support the AWS mobile SDKs, but we're actually building new native mobile SDKs that are now called Amplify Native. So kind of a lot of the stuff we're, we're doing is transitioning into this Amplify uh, category. Um, and I'll talk about exactly what Amplify is, but essentially you could kind of categorize it as full stack cloud tooling and SDKs. So what does that mean? You know, full stack cloud, full stack cloud tooling, full stack serverless. That's a lot of the, the terminology you'll hear me talk about. Um, and I'll hopefully explain exactly what we're doing there. So Amplify is essentially broken up into three parts. You have uh, the command line interface, the CLI. So the CLI is essentially a, an infrastructure as code generator. You can think of it as that. So if you're used to using something like CDK or serverless framework or even CloudFormation, you understand uh, that you typically need to understand the, um, the way that your YAML and the way that your JSON is configured and you have to understand the naming conventions, a lot of that stuff to kind of build anything. And you also kind of have to understand how AWS works to an extent. I think that the cool thing that we're doing with the CLI is that we're taking a, a we're taking it kind of up another level of abstraction. So um, we're um, using the CLI, prompting the, the developer for questions that are more category based and more functionality based. So for instance, let's say you wanted to build an API gateway endpoint with Lambda. Um, you could run a command, amplify add API. We would then walk you through all the steps to set up API Gateway, Lambda. Uh, we would even scaffold out some code for you to have a basic express server or a hello world um, you know, function running. We would configure cores. We would configure all the stuff with an API Gateway to kind of make that work. And then, the, and then what, what you end up with after those series of commands is basically some cloud formation that you don't actually have to ever work with, but it's written for you if you ever did want to kind of take it and put it over. And therefore, uh, we think that we're kind of lowering the barrier to entry to get up and running with all this stuff. But we're also, in my opinion, um, giving like more developer velocity for people that are looking to just kind of build extremely quickly. Let's say that you want to kind of try out this new idea um, and you know that you need authentication and an API and a Lambda function, right? Um, that's kind of like what you typically would see when prototyping in, in the serverless world. You know, to get that up and running with the CLI is like uh, maybe a 10 minute, you know, exercise. And you don't have to actually remember and, and know how to kind of like configure all of your cloud formation um, or any of that, that infrastructure is code. So it's kind of interesting there. And I think it will be really cool in the future if we could actually support CDK as an output target. So therefore you could kind of port over your CDK from Amplify into your main um, CDK. Like if that's kind of what you'd like to work with or, or maybe even serverless framework or something. And then we have the client libraries and the client libraries are what you would then use to connect to your um, backend services from your front end app. So it, it, we have uh, support now for not only web and native iOS and native Android, but we also support React Native and we also are building in uh, a new team to support Flutter. And uh, essentially what we'd like to do is have a very consistent API across all these platforms. Of course, it's not going to be um, completely consistent, but just because of the language differences and things like that. But the general idea should feel very similar across all of these uh, different platforms. It should be a similar experience. So the workflow would typically be you use a CLI to generate your service, then you use the client library to connect to the service. I'll look at, I'll show you what those APIs look like in just a moment. And then the last thing we have is a hosting service. This is kind of a really nice, and it's probably the fastest growing thing that we've, we've launched. And it essentially is just a really simple, easy to use uh, hosting service for web applications. You connect your GitHub repo, we then take all of your code, we run a build, and we then deploy to a globally available CDN. Uh, we use um, edge computing and we, we, we have um, everything built in that, that kind of, you know, you would typically need to set up on your own. And, um, and then you can then integrate CI and CD via GitHub. 
uh, via git commit. So you could basically run a build any time you merge the master, or you could then maybe even do uh, previews based on branch branches that you've pushed up. So let's say that you create a new branch, you want to kind of see how that looks. Uh, we automatically will build out a new deployment uh, based on a branch, and we would even allow you to set up different backend environments based on those pushes and those commits. So therefore, we would rebuild your entire infrastructure in a different environment and let you test it out before merging. Um, and then only the merge, uh, only the diff of the merge would go into master. So how does the CLI work? Well, it looks something like this. You, um, you initialize a new project with Amplify init. You then add a feature with Amplify add. You then deploy the actual backend, uh, the new feature, or you deploy an update by running Amplify push. And then after you've deployed, if you want to make any updates, you just run Amplify update, and then you type in the name of the category that you'd like to update. And then what you end up with is a couple of things. And we talk about full stack tooling, and this is going to make a little more sense here, hopefully. Uh, in the cloud, what we build out for you is a cloud formation stack, and then, of course, the AWS service generation for the category that you've created. Um, locally, we also create a couple of resources, though. Um, so if you're in a um, mobile app or if you're in a web app, it kind of will differ the type of resources we create, and we'll detect that um, at the project generation level, at the, at the stage of the project generation. Um, what we do generate locally is an Amplify folder, and the Amplify folder contains your, your infrastructure as code, essentially. Um, there we have two different main folders. We have a build folder, uh, or in, it's labeled as a backend folder, actually. And then we have a current cloud backend, which is the current representation of what's deployed right now. So you basically have the, 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 uh, the, the backend folder that you would update to make changes. And then when you deploy the current cloud backend and the backend would be in sync. And then we also create a client configuration file that has all of the references to those resources that you've created. And you would basically then import that into your, into your app, and then therefore you could start making the calls against the backend services. And then as you make updates via the CLI, we update the Amplify folder and the client configuration uh, for you. So after you create the service with the CLI, you then use the Amplify client uh, to make requests. So for instance, if you wanted to interact with API Gateway, um, we, we allow you to create multiple API Gateway endpoints. And then uh, as you create these endpoints, you label them with different names. So let's say I created a API gateway endpoint called my API. Um, you would be able to then interact with that API um, gateway endpoint using uh, HTTP verbs like get, put, post, delete, and so on and so forth. So here would be kind of a look at how you might call api.get and um, you would pass in the name of the API as a first argument and then the path as a second argument. Um, we also have, of course, a bunch of different SDKs for different services, but another one that kind of is interesting that a lot of people is, is working with S3. So how does that look? It's pretty simple. You just import the storage uh, category from Amplify, and then we have different um, methods on storage, like storage.delete, storage.get, and, and so on and so forth. And you would just pass in the key that you'd like to get um, and there's additional optional configuration uh, around security and, all, and, um, and stuff like that that you could also pass in as a second argument. <coughs> so what happens you know, here? You know, again, you're getting two things. You get, uh, when we talk about full stack, we're talking about we're building the back end and the front end. So when you're running all of these commands, you do end up with back end infrastructure as code, but you also end up with client side code. I mentioned already the Amplify folder and uh, I mentioned the local configuration, but we also do a lot of other stuff. So for instance, um, if you're working with the GraphQL API, you typically need to create um, local um, references or, or local code for all of the GraphQL operations that you need to interact with. So if you have a CRUD API for create, read, update, delete, let's say on a, a to-do app or something, you need to have a create to do mutation. You need an update to do, you know, delete to do mutation. You also need a query definition. And you also, if you'd like to implement real time functionality, have a um, subscription for um, listening to that. And you have to have all those definitions locally. What we, what we do though, we, we do a lot of code generation. So we would basically allow you to just generate your, uh, 
GraphQL schema, and then we introspect that schema, and we, and we basically say, okay, you have this type. We're just going to assume that you need all these operations, and if you, if you want to use them, you can. If not, whatever. But we generate all of that code locally. So we do a lot of other client-side code generation as well. So what are the categories that we support at the moment? So I, I mentioned that we don't talk about it in a service-based fashion. It's more of a category-based fashion. And uh, some of these categories actually implement multiple services under the hood. So for instance, uh, uh, if you think about it, have, um, a end-to-end -end API with Lambda and API Gateway, or it will allow you to have an end-to-end -end API with, with AppSync and maybe Lambda like all together because you can actually use a Lambda function as a GraphQL resolver. So when you're, when, you're, when you're adding one of these services, a lot of times we're doing multiple things. But these are kind of all of the different categories that we support at the moment. But within storage, we have multiple categories. For instance, storage is uh, also not only S3, but also DynamoDB. API is GraphQL and also um, REST. And we're thinking about adding more you know, op op options actually to the API category. But yeah, that's kind of the general idea. And then under the hood, the services that we, we implement are uh, many. So API Gateway, I mentioned that, of course, AppSync, DynamoDB, Amplify Console Hosting, uh, AWS Lambda, Cognito, Pinpoint Sumerian, uh, so Sumerian for XR. So we do uh, allow you to kind of embed the uh, augmented reality and virtual reality scenes within your app. And then we also support a bunch of ML services. So we have this new predictions category, fairly new, I guess. And basically, it allows you to interact with a lot of uh, machine learning services. So Polylex, Transcribe, all of these things are su really simple to kind of get up and running with really with, uh, with what we've built in. And um, we also have plugins. So like uh, community members and other people within AWS can create plugins. And I think one of the most popular ones right now is Amplify Video, which uses um, uh, AWS Elemental uh, Live and allows you to kind of create your own live streaming platform using an Amplify CLI plugin. So what about the tooling? I mentioned some of that. Well, one of the things that we have, and this is the main part of my talk, it's called the GraphQL Transform Library. And it's essentially infrastructure is GraphQL. Hopefully this will make sense in just a moment. When you think about a GraphQL API, you typically have a few different pieces that you, that you need to kind of get up and running. You need a GraphQL schema, which defines not only the types of data in your app, but also the operations that you're going to be performing against your backend uh, database or whatever you're going to be interacting with. Once you've created your schema, you then have to have resolvers for all of those different operations. So if I have a create to do mutation, I need to map that mutation to a data source. And the way that you do that in GraphQL is with the resolver. So it's almost like a function really, just a resolver you can think of as a function that's gonna be interacting with some backend service or even a lambda function or whatever, it's just a function. Um, and then in addition to the schema and the resolvers, you have your data sources. So with, uh, with GraphQL, the great thing about it is you can actually use your GraphQL API as kind of an API gateway because your data sources are not limited at, at all. And when you're working with your own GraphQL server, you could, of course, map that to whatever you'd like. But with AppSync, we actually um, also are really adamant about escape patches. And using um, the different data sources that we've provided, you can pretty much do anything, in my opinion. And I've, I've rarely seen people limited uh, with AppSync as far as the data sources are concerned. Because by, by default, we have a, fir a few first-class data sources. So DynamoDB, uh, Elasticsearch, Amazon uh, Aurora, and Lambda and HTTP. So um, I mentioned the first three are kind of like known databases, but what about Lambda? Well, you can map your GraphQL operation into a Lambda function, and that pretty much is an escape patch to do whatever you'd like. And then once you execute uh, whatever you'd like to do in that Lambda, then you can just pull the request back in via AppSync. Um, that pretty much opens the door to anything. And then HTTP endpoints are really interesting because they allow you to basically map your GraphQL operations to an existing REST API or any HTTP endpoint. So even if you want to like integrate something that's already out there, if you have some microservice architecture going on, uh, you can basically do that. You can send headers, you can pass in whatever you'd like. So um, 
but but the the general idea here is what I'm basically trying to get uh, point out here is that when you're creating a GraphQL API, you have uh, there's kind of a lot of upfront work. You need your schema resolvers and your data sources. You have to be um, especially if you like to make it scale. Well, the GraphQL Transform Library is uh, essentially a very broad abstraction, a very powerful abstraction on, type, on top of both GraphQL as well as um, CloudFormation. And what it allows you to do is create your GraphQL schema with just the very basic types that you like to work with. You can then run a build. And what we end up doing is we look at the different directives that you have specified in your GraphQL schema, and we then deploy not only your backend infrastructure, but also a lot of configuration around authorization rules. So what are some of the different directives and how, do, how, how are they actually gonna work? Well, these are what we support right now. We have at model, at off, at connection, key, function, searchable, predictions, and HTTP. Some of these are a little self-explanatory, but I'm gonna talk about uh, the first four in this talk, and we're gonna actually write some code and, and see how this works. So the first three, I'm gonna actually really go in a little bit more depth on here because uh, in my opinion, they're kind of the most uh, used, the most important. So the at model is the first one I'll talk about. And at model is a, decor a directive that you can add to any type that will allow you to then build out your database via DynamoDB, all of the CRUD and list operations that you would need for this type. So for instance, for a product, you might have create, read, update, delete, and list products you would also have your subscriptions for real-time updates. So we would also create the on create product, on update and on delete product. So all those CRUD operations are generated using the at model, but also we create the resolvers that map between DynamoDB and all of those operations. So just using this one at model directive actually gets you a lot of code and also a lot of functionality out of the box. But what you could then do for any, um, business logic or things, anything like that, you can then simply go into your resolvers and kind of write your own code if you need anything else there. Um, and the idea behind this library is that we'd like to, to do as much as possible to where you can kind of use these directives and describe how your application wants to, to, to perform without writing so much of your own custom business logic. But we offer the escape hatch just in case, of course, you probably are gonna need that at some point. But uh, essentially we're, we're doing a lot of work to kind of um, make this even more and more powerful. So again, you, you, you run the build um, after you've run, uh, added the directive, you get the CRUD and list schema, the DynamoDB table and the GraphQL resolvers. So that's add model. Um, you can then add additional transformers. So at auth is uh, one of those uh, transformers we'll look at. At auth allows you to enable authorization rules. So let's say that we wanted to have a product, but uh, we wanted to um, only allow the person that created this product to be able to update uh, or delete it. But we might want, um, actually, and, and I believe in, in using this directive as I have it now would only allow the owner to read it as well. But we'll look at uh, how more. Multiple authorization functionality. And actually a type of product might not be the best example. Um, maybe you could think of like a type of post for a blog post. Um, this might make a little more sense or anything that you wanna create um, to kind of uh, enable only the owner to have access to it, right? But you can actually pass in an array of rules and kind of add additional functionality. So let's say that we had uh, a product and we wanted to allow anyone to be able to read that product. So anyone that is using the app should be able to kind of list that product, but only the person that created the product should be able to edit it. We can actually pass in um, the first rule is allow owner. And then we might pass an additional rule that says allow public, which gives it complete public access, but we can specify the operations for this public access. So here we're basically saying um, anyone that is a uh, unauthenticated, can, can read the products, can fetch a single product, but the owner is the only one that can update the product. So this makes a lot of sense when you're thinking about uh, a lot of different applications really, but let's say that you have a blog and you only wanted the owner of the post to be able to edit the post, but you wanted anyone to be able to read it. This kind of makes a lot of sense there. 
The, the, the third one I'd like to talk about is app key. And this allows you to, to since you're using DynamoDB, to configure custom indexes on your, uh, on your type. So let's go back to a very basic app model. Let's say we wanted to enable another access pattern on this, on this uh, type. Let's say that we wanted to be able to not only query inventory by ID and just list all the inventory, but let's say we maybe wanted to query the inventory by warehouse ID and the warehouse ID is already a field that we're saving in the database. We can add an array of different keys here. And what we can say is uh, we want to have the, uh, the key that we're gonna create is gonna be uh, named by warehouse ID. Um, the field that we're gonna use to query is gonna be warehouse ID, and then we're gonna define the query that we'd like to be able to then run to access this. So we'd be able to then say, okay, we wanna get items by warehouse ID. The argument here would be the warehouse ID. And essentially we're running a DynamoDB query, which is a very you know, performant and, and, and great way to interact with DynamoDB. And on your, um, your type, you can add, again, as many fields as you want, as many access patterns as you'd like. So this is kind of just an abstraction on top of DynamoDB uh, GSIs. So taking all that into consideration, um, I'm gonna kind of be doing a live demo here. And what I'd like to do is show you how to rapidly prototype an API using the GraphQL Transform Library. Um, what we wanna build is an API. Um, so we wanna kind of come up with uh, our basic GraphQL API. We wanna create a schema. We then wanna go ahead and generate all of those things that I talked about, the resolvers, the database, uh, authorization rules, and also relationships. So I didn't really talk about relationships, but let's say you wanted to create uh, one to many, many to one, or many to many relationships between types. We have a directive that does that. It's called at connection, and I'll show you how that works. So with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and jump over to the demo. All right, so I have a Amplify project that I've created here. And what I'd like to do is go ahead and add an API. So I'm gonna go ahead and run Amplify Add API. And this is gonna walk us through either building a REST API or a GraphQL API. So I'm gonna choose GraphQL. And now it's gonna kind of walk me through a different, few different steps. So I'm gonna give the API a name. I'll call this uh, Meetup. For the default authorization type, you can choose the default and then add additional authorization types on top of it. Because I'm gonna be needing uh, to implement some authorization rules, I'm gonna use Amazon Cognito user pool. And this is basically Amazon Cognito, which I've already enabled for this, for this, uh, for this, AP, for this app. So I've, I've created the uh, authorization or, or authentication by running Amplify add auth prior to this. So I'm just gonna choose that as the default and Amazon Cognito is just a managed identity service if you haven't already used it, which you probably have if you're in this, uh, in this talk. So um, the next thing, do you wanna configure advanced settings? We don't, so I'll choose no. If we have a GraphQL schema already built for our app, we could actually reference that here, but since we don't, we're starting from scratch, I'm gonna choose no. And do I want a guided schema creation? I'm gonna choose yes to kind of show off the different uh, code generation or a part of the different code generation that we do. So we can actually just give you a starter GraphQL schema for a few different types of apps. So you have a single object with fields, you have an example of a one-to-many relationship, and then you also have an example of fine-grained access control, which is you know, basically some authorization rules. I'm just gonna start with a sing single object with fields because we're gonna be starting uh, from scratch. I'm just gonna basically be deleting that anyway. Do I wanna edit the schema now? I'll go ahead and choose yes, and this should open up the schema in my text editor. Um, so what I have here is basically a type of to-do. And what I wanna do is, is delete this and I wanna build a, a event app or a meetup app or a conference app. This, uh, I would say a conference app, right? So um, to start that off, I'm just gonna go ahead and start by creating uh, my first type. So for a conference app or for a meetup app, you probably wanna have a way to create a talk and then uh, let's say the app also had a way to comment on a talk. We're gonna also talk about how to create comments on the talk. For the talk type, I'm adding this at model directive, which again, gives us DynamoDB table, CRUD operations and resolvers, giving it a few different fields. So for each talk, you have a talk name, a talk summary, a speaker name and a speaker bio. 
The next thing we'll create is, a to, uh, is another GraphQL type for a comment. Comment, very similar to talk. We just have an at model directive with a few different fields. Uh, I think most importantly is the message, you know, what is the comment? And then created by, which is gonna be interesting because it's gonna be populated by uh, AppSync for us based on who is making the comments. So we have those two things. The next thing we wanna do is we need to create a relationship between a talk and a comment. Because when someone creates a comment, we don't want it to show up in the main app or on every talk. We only want that comment to show up on the talk um, that the person's trying to comment on. So to do that, we can actually add a directive called at connection and say that the talk is gonna have many comments and we want to map the comments to the, um, the, the comment type by using this at connection. And then we're gonna create the other end of this relationship by setting a talk field on the comment itself and then also passing in the at connection and then, and then kind of making sure the name fields are, uh, match. <clears throat> so, so what we have here is two types and we have relationships. The next thing we wanna do is add some rules so basically what I want to say is I want to say that only admins can uh, create, re, uh, I'm sorry, create, update, or delete a talk. We don't want the average user of the app to be able to create a talk, right, or even update it. Um, only admins. So to do that, I can use the at auth directive and pass in a rule. The rule that I'm going to set is groups. And this is going to be reading the cognito group that the user is a part of. And can pass in if those from the types. So you could have dynamic groups by having like something like this. That would also work. But for the demo, I think this is fine. So I'm gonna say I want admins to be able to, um, you know, create operations. And then I wanna set the rules for queries to null because I want all users to be able to query against the API, right? So anyone should be able to kind of like see the talk information, but not everyone should be able to update it. And then the last thing we want to do is add maybe an authorization rule around comments. So with comments, it's a little different because we want everyone to be able to uh, create a comment, but we only want the person that created the comment to be able to maybe update it or, or delete it. So what we're going to say is uh, allow owner, which will automatically say anyone can create a comment, but only the uh, creator of the comment can make updates. Um, we can set what the owner field is. So I'm gonna say, I want the owner field to be set to created by. Therefore, when an operation is made, by default, AppSync is gonna look, um, find the identity of the user and associate it with this created by field in the resolver. And then I also wanna set queries to null because everyone should be able to read the comments. So I'm gonna go ahead and save that and jump back to my CLI. And this is basically uh, going to go ahead and introspect the schema, make sure that the schema that we're using is a valid GraphQL schema. And then if it, if it is, it should give us some uh, feedback saying that the schema is comp compiled successfully. So we've created that. So how do we test it out? Well, we could deploy it and test it within the AppSync console and AWS uh, console, or we can just say amplify mock API and actually test it out locally. And this is an interesting uh, thing that we got built into the into the system, right? Because you don't have to actually deploy anything. You can, you can actually start modeling your data and testing it all out locally, even your authorization rules and everything. And then once you're ready to go, you can then deploy it. So you're not uh, wasting too much time. What happens is we're gonna look at the directives and we're gonna create all the tables locally. So what we've done here is we've created that talk table and the comment table. We can also generate the GraphQL code that you'll need to interact with this from your client app um, and if you're if you were on iOS or Android these choices will be different but since we're on uh, a web web app um, that's kind of the default that I'm working with it's gonna let us choose either JavaScript TypeScript or flow for the code generation I'm not gonna be using this code but I'm just gonna walk through these steps uh, where does the code need to live do I want to generate all of the operations and what's the maximum statement depth for for the operations I'm just gonna leave the defaults for all that so what this does is actually generates a graphical editor, a GraphQL server running at your, at your uh, local host. So I should be able to go ahead and open this up and test this out locally. 
So what we see here is we actually have um, in our, you know, in our, um, you know, app, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> in our browser, we have the app, uh, the graphical editor running. So what we want to do is we want to create a mutation for the app and uh, because we want to go ahead and create a talk. So what I'm going to do is I'll go ahead and choose create talk and um, specify the field we'd like to return. For the speaker bio, I'll put, uh, you know, something like whatever, speaker name. All right, so we should be able to go ahead and uh, test this out by running this here. And what you see is actually exactly what we want. We are not authorized to do this because we are just a regular user. You actually have to be an admin to do this. So uh, first thing we validated is our authorization rules are working. So how do we actually simulate an admin user? Well, let's go ahead and create a JWT using, um, using you know, the, uh, the tool that we built into, the, into this, right? And what we can do is we can actually specify our username. So I'm gonna go ahead and say I'm Davit3. I'm gonna put myself in the admin group. And I'm gonna go ahead and generate a JWT that's now gonna be passed in with this request. So now we should be able to go ahead and create this mutation. And now we see that the, the operation was successful. And what we wanna do now is create a comment on this talk. And to do that, we need the talk ID. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy that. And we're gonna go ahead and create uh, another um, operation. And I'm gonna create a comment, passing in the comment uh, talk ID. And I'll talk, I'll pass in a message saying, uh, great talk. So we have that stuff there. And uh, the last thing I need to do is update auth because I want to simulate now another user. So I want to take myself out of the admin group, generate a new token, and then I'm going to make a comment on this talk. So uh, that's successful. So we've created a talk, we've created a comment on the talk. The last thing we'll do is query, and uh, I'll go ahead and open up my queries here, and I'll say I want to add a new query, and I want to go ahead and list every talk. I want to get the uh, talk ID, speaker name, all, all that stuff. But what I also want to do is actually list the comments for this talk, the relationship that we made, and we can actually see that that's actually already built in here. So. We see that we also have a, a comments array that we can also fetch. So I wanna also fetch all the comments. I wanna know who created it and what the message was. So our query looks like this. We're gonna list the talks. We're gonna get the talk info. We're also gonna list comments for the talks. And we want the info like created at, created by a message. So now we're, we're seeing that the query is successfully run. And what we have here is the relationship is actually working. So we have our talks, we have our comments, and we actually have created by was populated automatically for us because you, you remember all we passed in was the message. Created by was read off of the JWT. Um, and that's done in, in the resolver itself. We basically have a uh, variable called context.identity that tells you all the identity of, of the caller. <clears throat> so that's it, we kind of built out that whole uh, API in just a couple of minutes and this now and pass in a few thousand uh, up, upvotes into a voting app within a couple of seconds and uh, see that uh, app scales pretty well. So that's the demo. Um, let's go through some examples now. And I, I mentioned the example I'm gonna look at in just a moment. Uh, the first is a voting app and this is something I'm still prototyping. Uh, I'm gonna make it open source so people can see how to build a voting app. Um, for the GraphQL schema that I, I, I worked with for this app, I have two types. I have a poll type and a candidate type. So um, people can create a poll and then they can create candidates for that poll. So you might think of like who is the best movie star as the poll name and then the candidates would be like the people that you think should be uh, under that. And we have a few different things going on. So we have the authorization rules. Um, so for instance, I only want admins to be able to create a poll, um, but I want uh, the public to be able to read the poll and then maybe we can add uh, additional operations uh, around that but for now that's pretty pretty basic that's pretty much what you would need we want anyone to be able to read a poll um, 
And then we also have uh, the at key, which allows us to define uh, different access patterns. So I have an items by type, which allows me to kind of, if I wanted to be able to create different types of polls, query just for those types of polls. And then we have a, a candidate type, and each poll is gonna have at least two candidates, right? And the candidate has a poll candidate's ID, which is essentially the relationship between the poll and the candidate. Uh, the candidate can have an image or, an, or, a, uh, or not, because maybe it's a, uh, a text poll. So let's say uh, there's basically two types of polls. You can create images or text. So um, if it's an image, it'll have an image. If it's, if it's a text, it would have uh, a name. Um, so let's, let's take a look at how this works. And this is, again, still kind of early on, but it, it just it works. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demo it. So um, this is a poll that I've created. It says that it's cereal soup. And um, you'll see that uh, if I go to the main app, I have a couple of different polls here going on. Um, actually, I think this, this view is actually broken because I've been trying to, uh, to, to simulate the multiple upvotes. But let's say we wanted to um, you know, hammer this thing and, 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 and uh, send a bunch of uh, upvotes. So basically what I have is uh, I have a simulate upvotes button here. And I believe in the code um, we're sending around um, 1,000 upvotes if you click this. Let's see here. Yeah, so we're going to basically simulate 1,000 upvotes. Maybe we'll hit the, uh, we'll make every upvote happen within 10 milliseconds. And what we are hoping to see is that this doesn't break, but we're also hoping to see that because I've actually implemented real-time functionality, that when we run this app on this browser, we see the updates come through over here. So let's go ahead and try this out. So we're sending a bunch of upvotes and there's something interesting happened on the left-hand side, some type of blue mark. I don't know where that came from. So we're sending the upvotes. Um, everything seems to be going pretty well. So we've just sent in a thousand upvotes, right? So it looks like it's working, but like, how do we know for sure if it's working? So let's go ahead and, and refresh and see if we pull down the same vote number. Uh, and it looks like it worked. So we just basically simulated uh, Pretty, pretty impressive, in my opinion, um, you know, functionality that was built pretty simply. So let's bring this down to maybe five milliseconds and, and maybe bump it up to 2,000 votes and see if we can and see if it, this still continues to work. Seems to be working. Now, recognize that every time one of these operations goes through, we're basically triggering a GraphQL subscription on the other client. So every time one of these goes through, we have that WebSocket connection. So we're handling pretty massive scale updates between uh, the two clients. Now we have, we have customers with millions of, of, of users that are using GraphQL subscriptions, right? Like Ticketmaster is one of the big customers for AppSync and, and they have massive scale. But it's really cool to see that using just some really pretty basic rudimentary stuff to get going, you can actually build stuff like this that scale. So if I refresh we should hope to see that it's still exactly at 4559 everything works perfectly um, just to kind of demonstrate the scale of what AppSync can do so uh, that's kind of a, a voting app let's look at a document collaboration app so um, document collaboration I have a type of document with an at model directive uh, the document has an ID it has content which is the content of the document that is stringified using you know uh, whatever you like to use so for me I'm using JavaScript on the client so I'm using json.stringify and then parsing it, uh, stringifying it when I send it to the server and then parsing it on the client. And then I'm basically storing that whole stringified data um, on the server. And then I'm able to create a subscription to that content. So whenever it changes, I'm able to update um, the, other, um, the other view. So let's take a look at how that works. So I have a, uh, a demo running at uh, right with, right with me.dev. And I'm gonna go ahead and create a post. We'll call this AWS user group. And I'll go ahead and move that over here and then I'll have it running over here. And the cool thing about this is that uh, you can actually write your, uh, your content in Markdown and you'll see that it should come through on, on the left side in real time. Um, let's see here. You can also see that uh, we can write anything that we'd like to. So we can also use stuff like uh, images. 
And we can also write code. And this, this is also um, done using, you know, using GraphQL subscriptions. So um, we basically are stringifying all this, sending it to the server, um, have a little bit of a debounce going on, or not debounce, but uh, using some type of uh, buffer to where we only send updates every like half second. So if someone hammers this, it would like, you know, not break. Yeah, I just copied and pasted a bunch of times to show. But yeah, let's bring it back down to one. Okay. But yeah, that's kind of that, that example. And then the last example I'll show is um, drawing collaboration. So drawing collaboration, let me move this thing here. Drawing collaboration is very similar to the document collaboration where we basically have uh, some data that we stringify. And um, we want to be able to have people be able to create a drawing, share a drawing, and collaborate on a drawing. We also want to make sure that the drawings can either be uh, locked or unlocked. If it's locked, then no one can edit it. And um, we also want to have a public and private. So for the, uh, for the public and private access, I'm basically setting an item type. Therefore, we can query only for, uh, for public or private or any other types of drawings that, that people create. To, to kind of an app running at pixelme.dev. And this is uh, a React app that I kind of created using someone else's um, project. It's called Pixel Art React. So what I'll do is I'll just, uh, I'll open up someone, some existing drawing. And what I'll do is I'll uh, duplicate this drawing and go ahead and do that. Now we have this, this, this cat here. And what we want to do is uh, make some updates. So what I'll do is maybe I'll change the background color to red. I'll change it over here. And you'll see that as we change it there, the updates come through on the other end. And let's say that I'm, uh, I'm a user over here and I want to kind of change some, some stuff myself. You know, I'll go over here and I'll make some changes. Oops. For some reason, the updates are not coming through on this side. Let's see what's going on there. Let's try that again. I'm wondering if the subscription didn't get triggered for some, for some reason. There we go. So as you see, we're making updates. Everything comes through. And you're able to kind of like collaborate and share and stuff like that. And that's it. So yeah, thank you for, uh, for checking this out. Um, if you want to follow me, I'm on Twitter at Dabit3. If you're not already following me, definitely follow me there. Thank you for having me.